Hello, I'm John Murray in the Denver Post newsroom. I'm here today with the candidates for Denver City Council's District 10 for on the spot Colorado Source for Everything Politics. We're here today to talk about the runoff race that comes up on June 2nd. The two candidates you'll be meeting were the top two finishers in a five way race for the open Central Denver City Council seat on May 5th. They are vying to replace City Councilwoman Jeannie Robb in the runoff on June 2nd. Wayne New led the field in the first round with almost 35% of the vote. He's a retired healthcare consultant and hospital administrator who has been a neighborhood activist in Cherry Creek. Anna Jones came in second with just over 33% of the vote. She works as a community development consultant. She also served on the Denver Planning Board. So I want to start by asking uh, the most basic question of both of you about just kind of what you set you apart. Um, so Mr. New, uh, why do you think mm. you're the best qualified? Yeah. Well, for over a decade, I've been involved with community activities. I've been a, uh, been a representative for our residents and our neighborhoods and protecting the quality of life we enjoy. Over the last several years, uh, the, the city has been on an overdevelopment drive, increasing heights and density, and, and really not paying attention to the parking and traffic concerns that we have. So I've been a strong voice for our residents, and I want to continue to be that strong voice in, on city council and make sure that our voices are heard and make sure we're all part of making Denver a great city. If we do that, I think we'll have all the input and advice from all the stakeholders to make sure that all concerns and we have a balanced approach to development. All right, and Ms. Jones, how about you? What makes you best qualified? Well, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I, uh, I love the city of Denver. I grew up here. Um, and after college and then the Peace Corps, my husband and I moved to Congress Park where we've now been for 20 years. Uh, we're raising two teenage boys uh, who have been attending all District 10 public schools. Um, I'm very vested in the community and have been very active in my community. I have a professional background in community and economic development and uh, looking at urban issues and balancing strong neighborhoods with commercial districts and understanding how those two can strengthen one another. And um, again, my, my planning board experience, I think, really lends itself to understanding the nuance and the complexities of, of land use decision making and um, feel like I could have a lot of experience to bring uh, to the table. And I look forward to doing that. All right. Well, so on, you mentioned development. Um, you know, District 10 has seen a lot of vertical growth and it's also seen you know, a very high level of pushback for some projects in the city um, through all these planning processes, um, and especially in Cherry Creek and Capitol Hill. It seems that any project that would add density um, to a neighborhood in Denver is likely to, to get pushback from those who live around it. Um, now, Ms. Jones, uh, on council, how will you evaluate your vote in a controversial, controversial rezoning case? Well, I think, um, you know, we have to look at each development and we have to understand how the development fits within the existing zoning, um, how it meets the needs of the community, and if there's room for discussion, how to have a balanced discussion that really brings forth consensus. Uh, you know, all of these decisions need to be made looking at the, a balance between prop individual property rights and what's best for the community. And, um, you know, these aren't easy decisions, they're messy. Um, but uh, I have 20 years of building consensus and, and feeling very positive that people do want the best outcomes. And I think often people want to see eye to eye. And I feel like I have the, the training and the capabilities to do that. Now, from your experience on the planning board, um, where does the rubber meet, tend to meet the road when it comes to you know, some of these controversial cases? Are there instances where neighborhoods are, are making unrealistic demands? Or do you think they generally um, are, are on solid ground? Oh gosh, y you know, I think uh, uh, both. I think both is true, both are true. Um, I think, y you know, people don't like change. P change is scary, and understandably so. Our city is growing um, in the most intense rate it ever has, so we are going to have to deal with these pressures. And there is no silver bullet. Um, the silver bullet to me really is, you know, it's not rocket science. It is conversations, it's productive conversations, it's reaching compromise, and it's trying to address all sides of an issue and listening a lot. Now, um, Wayne, how about you? How will you look at um, some of these yeah. dynamics in a controversial case? Well, I'm just very, uh, I feel very strongly about uh, neighborhood planning. You know, we, all our neighborhoods are so different. And, you know, the neighborhood plans that are being developed that address the zoning and the development of those areas are, 
are, are very unique to that neighborhood. The Golden Triangle just finished their neighborhood plan, which calls for more heights and density, which is perfect for them. It's a, not a very urban environment. I take another neighborhood, you, it may not be density, may not be called for. As we build transit, you know, obviously density will probably be uh, much more favorable in those transit nodes where, where we're trying to get people out of their cars and, and you can use uh, density to help provide affordable housing for those, those people. So I think you need to look at each, each project, but also put it in context with the neighborhood itself. Every neighborhood is involved with a, a development of the city with the neighborhoods and the residents. And so we got to make sure that each development fits very well with what's called for the character of that neighborhood. And what do you think of, of um, how Cherry Creek and Cherry Creek North look now? Has, has, you know, you've been on, on yeah. talking about overdevelopment. Where did that go wrong? Well, we started uh, about four years ago with the planning process, and I think it, it was a real drive by the city for increased heights and density. Um, we opposed a lot of that heights and density and uh, especially making sure that it fit and trying to preserve a lot of the character of Cherry Creek. We want to grow and prosper, so our, our residents are not against development, but it's just all about uh, a balanced approach, making sure that as we grow, uh, make sure it doesn't affect the quality of life in our neighborhood with increased parking, uh, in inadequate parking, and increased traffic. Those are the big, big issues that our residents and all the neighborhoods around Cherry Creek feel that same way. They don't want overdevelopment creeping into their neighborhood without them being a part of the solution of making sure that it fits well with their neighborhood. What do you think about some of the more recent tall projects there? Have, is the city getting it right now or is there still a little bit too much? Well, we, uh, we had in, on Columbine, we have two major projects there and one, the uh, uh, neighborhoods of Country Club and Cherry Creek North had to step in to take some action to make sure that the city understood even though the city didn't agree with uh, the overdevelopment uh, context of those buildings, um, it did end up working out well with the district court ruling and, and lenders stepping in to make sure that that building was converted from an office use to a, a hotel use, which fits the parking uh, requirements for the zoning and much better fit for our, our community now. So it, it's something that we need to make sure that everybody listens to our residents and our residents' voices are heard and everybody works together to come up with a solution, not just mandating uh, zoning that uh, doesn't fit the neighborhood. So it sounds like you'd be a little bit more willing to vote no on a rezoning than your, the person you'd be succeeding. Well, I'll take it e easily with uh, each individual project, but you've got to put it in context with the zoning in the neighborhood plan. I if it fits very well, it's, it's not going to be any problem whatsoever. I mean, coming to, to city council will be those exceptions to the rule more than anything. So things that don't fit the zoning, excessive <coughs> zoning, or, or things that are just out of character. So I think it takes a lot of discussion, and we want to make sure that everybody's just at the table talking about what's best for that, that community. All right. Well, we talked a little bit about policy. I want to turn a bit to politics with both of you. Um, now, uh, Mr. New, you've been a Republican in the past and have donated Republican candidates. Now you're registered as an unaffiliated voter. In last week's debate, I um, thought it was interesting you supported uh, the idea of a plastic bag fee and, and uh, talked quite a bit about environmentally focused efforts. You know, this is a nonpartisan election, but are you, I mean, you're running to represent a, a pretty liberal district. Has that been part of your consideration when you're thinking about some of these issues like the bag fee? Well, it, it has been very much. It's funny, all, all the several months that we've all been uh, having forums and discussion. We've never talked about social issues at all. It's always been about development or overdevelopment, parking, traffic, transit, and we haven't talked about it at all. And finally, when we're coming to have a discussion about that, I'm much more of a moderate individual when it comes to social issues. You know, I, I put out a flyer just to make sure everybody understands that I stand on uh, women's rights, gay rights, uh, uh, the environment, and uh, conservation. And the discussions, too, with uh, Travis Liker, who finished third, has been very helpful, too. He's, he's very uh, helped uh, as we develop some uh, positions on social issues, and so it's been very good. So I'm very much a moderate person, and I, I hate this uh, partisan politics that's brought into something that should be nonpartisan. We should all be just thinking about the issues and addressing the issues and working together, not having this divisiveness of Democrats versus Republicans. That's not going to create a great city. Now, uh, Ms. Jones, uh, supporters of your opponent like to point out that you receive lots of money um, from outside the district. This came up in the debate last week, including from lobbyists and developers. Um, now you said that you're proud to have a broad base of support, uh, but the pu public's perception often is that money buys a donor more access than regular people get. How would you uh, guard against that if you're elected? 
Well, I um, first of all, I have a very broad base of support, and from from all different factions. Um, from you know, I've got labor unions, uh, the carpenters union. I've got you know a whole a whole host of folks, the Blue Flower Fund, and yes, um, certainly some developers are are supporting me as they are Mr. New. Um, and I feel like. It is really important to listen to everybody, and I'm, um, you know, and I, I really am proud to have such a broad base of support. I think uh, citywide support is fabulous. District 10 is in the middle of the city. Uh, it is the most urban district. It is going to deal with many transit issues, many issues around social service, uh, many issues around density and housing, and all of those things. And those are all citywide issues. And um, I think the city uh, should be very interested in District 10. Um, so I, you know, I, again, I, I, I feel grateful and humbled and, and proud to have the support I have. Are there any um, donors who uh, gave to you that you turned down their donation? Um, gosh, that's a good question. No. Okay. All right. Um, and then last question, uh, Ms. Jones, um, you know, District 10 sees a lot of the effects of homelessness in this city. Uh, what ideas would you bring to that difficult issue that are really not part of the conversation right now? Thanks. I think that's a, a great question. And I, I do think there are some good uh, examples nationally. Um, the whole notion of social impact bonds, which is something that I have been thinking about and uh, researching quite a bit, um, certainly actually before this campaign begun, uh, to think about addressing those kinds of issues. And that is really looking at how um, individuals use a variety of services, uh, mental health services, medical services, justice system, and there, there are um, some folks who are identified as, as heavy users of those um, public systems. And what we know is housing those folks would cost less um, than having repeatedly, going, going through these uh, other systems in a repeated fashion. So um, there are cost savings to be had. Um, I hate to sound sort of, you know, black and white about this, but if we can save money by housing people and we understand what that number is and how to quantify it, then we can borrow against that, we can use that money for future um, housing and programs and uh, looking at it from that perspective. And, and um, in my professional life, I put um, a variety of finance districts together and public and private partnerships, understanding how to leverage dollars to, to um, address complicated um, situations like homelessness, and um, that's something I'm very, very passionate about and would love uh, to be able to jump into the conversation. The mayor is certainly having a conversation. Members of council have been very active about this. I think I can bring a new uh, perspective and some new thinking uh, to the table. All right, well, Mr. New, how about you? Um, what would you bring to the homelessness discussion? Well, we've had a lot of discussion about that. Everybody knows the root causes of homelessness, the addiction, mental illness, and job training. Housing is absolutely essential to get them off the street where they're most vulnerable and uh, it's also to reduce the expense of, of caring for the, the homeless. So it sounds like but there's a lot of agreement here then. There's a lot of agreement, but the main thing is we need to look out of our side and look at best practices. If you look, say New Orleans has started a homeless program where they have focused on the veterans there and they've ended it. They've ended homelessness, which no one thinks is possible. If you look at uh, Utah, Utah has a great program where they've reduced homelessness. Uh, Brooklyn, New York has a great program. I think we need to look outside of Denver to make sure we, we look at best practices and adopt them. So, but housing, and also we shouldn't centralize all the social services in one neighborhood. It has a great impact on the quality and an impact on our parks. So we need to make sure that we have, when we get to the housing, we have a traditional approach where the active treatment is away from neighborhoods and then you can transition back to the neighborhoods if it all works out. So it needs to be a really collaborative community approach, but housing is the key. All right, well, Ms. Jones and Mr. New, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Okay. That ends today's On the Spot. You can follow the Denver Post's coverage of all Denver races at denverpost.com slash politics and keep reading as our, Dem as our Denver Post political team covers Denver's election in the next two weeks. In the meantime, you can always find the latest news about Colorado politics and policy on The Spot blog at blogs.denverpost.com slash the spot. Thank you for joining us today for On the Spot. I'm John Murray in the Denver Post newsroom.